My name is Ilyana Sokova. I'm the executive director of the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our today's webinar. Um, the topic is extremely interesting. I think uh, there are more and more uh, publications that are being published on the impact of new technologies on nuclear security and overall on nuclear order and uh, enterprise. Some of the um, experts uh, alert, um, suggest that there are risks involved with these technologies, including cyber, artificial intelligence, new advanced conventional weapons, and many others. Some are claiming there there is practically no effect as they are uh, either uh, minimally affecting the existing uh, arrangements and security in the nuclear sphere. And, other, and others yet say that um, they may be even a positive impact some of these technologies um, would bring. Uh, we have two um, excellent panelists today who have conducted a study looking at how these uh, technologies and their impact on nuclear uh, security uh, view um, these issues. What, 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 what do the practitioners in the field saying us, like how they view these issues? But before I pass the floor to them and introduce them formally, let me just remind for um, people who are familiar with the Zoom etiquette uh, and webinars, but uh, also to those who are new to that, is that we are conducting this uh, webinar through Zoom and also video streaming it to YouTube. So there are two options. The um, webinar is being recorded uh, only the moderator, in this case myself, and the panelists, uh, Michal and Madeline, will be visible uh, in the recording. Um, if there are any technical difficulties, please email uh, the VCDNP at the events at vcdnp.org or message to one of the hosts of this webinar you see on the screen there are two signs, VCDNP and VCDNP. So if you do send a private message to them in the chat, they, they will receive your request um, about technical difficulties. For those of you who are on Zoom, uh, you may ask questions through the Q&A button. Uh, if you see it at the bottom of your screens. Um, so that's specifically for the Q&A. Uh, then uh, you will also see in the Zoom chat some of the information posted by our, uh, by us uh, related to the webinar. Those of you who are joining us on YouTube, if you do have questions and would like to them to to raise to raise them, uh, please then send your questions to again to events at vcdnp.org. With that, I'm very pleased to introduce our today's speakers. Uh, first, uh, Michal uh, Andeka. He's an assistant professor of international relations at Erasmus University, Rotterdam, where he studies international security with a focus on nuclear politics. He authored um, Iran's nuclear program and the Global South publication, as well as a number of papers which appeared in the International Studies Quarterly, European Journal of Political Research, uh, Cooperation, um, Research, Cooperation and Conflict, the Non-Proliferation Review, and elsewhere. In 2018 and 2019, he was a junior faculty fellow at Stanford University Center for International Security and Cooperation. Um, and Madeleine, uh, Zut is a research associate at Erasmus University Rotterdam in the Netherlands, where she works on emerging technologies and nuclear disarmament issues. 
She recently received an advanced Master of Science in International Relations from Leiden University in the Netherlands and has a BA in Political Science from the University of Toronto in Canada. And I'm very happy that we uh, are able to host you today and look forward to the study results that you've conducted. Please, Michal, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much, Elena, for this very kind introduction. And thank you to Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation for having us today. It's a great pleasure to share the results of our work uh, with you. Um, the result of the paper that you're going to see today, um, or the presentation that you're going to see today, is based on a research that uh, we conducted jointly with Madeleine on um, the um, link between emerging technologies and nuclear security with a particular emphasis on whether emerging technologies create new potential for nuclear disarmament. Um, this research was independently executed, but has been funded by and generously funded by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, whom we thank for their, um, for their support. Um, the presentation today, we're going to split the, the talk in between me and Madeleine. And I will, in, in a little while, I'll share the, the screen. And uh, Madeline is going to start and talk uh, a little bit more about um, more broader context of our study. And then I'll come back and talk more about the um, content and the results of our study. Uh, thank you so much, Elena, um, for, for your kind introduction. And uh, thank you to Noah for, for organizing this and to VCDNP for having us. Um, as, uh, as Michal said, um, I, I will be beginning the presentation and I will be kindly asking Michal to move to, to the next slide, <laughs> please. So recently policymakers have been more and more concerned about the impact of emerging technologies on the future of international security. Um, there's also been increased interest on the impact of these technologies on, on nuclear dynamics. But as Michal said, um, most of the research has been limited to the way that these technologies impact um, crisis escalation, risk perception, and crisis stability. And, and so by comparison, there's been far less attention and research devoted to the impact that these technologies have on, on disarmament. But given the, the heightened relevance of, of emerging technologies and the increased political salience of nuclear disarmament, this remains uh, an important research topic. And so it's in this context that we focused on a simple yet complex question, which is, is emerging technology good news for nuclear disarmament? Michal, if you could kindly go to the next slide. Thank you. So emerging technologies have um, changed the infrastructure um, of nuclear weapons. And so because of this, it's, it's altered the way that we think about nuclear deterrence and strategic stability. Now, when referring to emerging technologies, um, you know, some people say that technologies are always emerging, but the way that we kind of defined emerging technologies for, for this research is a technology um, it, it's emerging in the sense that the full potential of the technology is not yet known. So, um, you know, emerging technologies can include um, enabling dual use technologies like artificial intelligence and cyber, but it can also include new weapon systems like um, hypersonic cruise missiles and hypersonic gliding vehicles. So in our research, we weren't interested in the inherent or the intrinsic properties of these technologies. We were very interested in the strategic effects these technologies have in, in the nuclear sphere. So I wanna start out by, by kind of talking about the ways in which these technologies can destabilize nuclear deterrence and undermine strategic stability because they, they do this in a number of significant ways. So the first way is through entanglement. Entanglement is um, the increased interaction or the increased intertwining of nuclear and non-nuclear capabilities. There are several manifestations of entanglement, one of which is the dual use nature of command and control systems. 
So these command and control systems can be used for both nuclear operations and also non-nuclear or conventional operations. And as these command and control systems become, become increasingly reliant on um, digital technologies, they also become increasingly more vulnerable to non-nuclear threats like um, cyber interference, which can raise the risks of inadvertent escalation. So to give you kind of an, an example to, to make this a little bit clearer, an example of these dual use command and control systems are early warning satellites. Now, if you were to take the example of the US, um, US early warning satellites are used to track and identify both nuclear and non-nuclear threats. Now, if the US was involved in a conventional conflict with an adversary, and that adversary wanted to disable the US's early warning satellites through cyber interference to try to gain an advantage in a conventional conflict, because of the dual use nature of the early warning um, satellites, the US could misinterpret this as a prelude to a nuclear strike. And so this could lead to dangerous escalatory behavior. Now, another way that emerging technologies can destabilize nuclear deterrence is through the increased automation of nuclear decision making. Um, so on, on balance, machines are worse than humans at understanding human signaling, which is uh, used in deterrence. And having humans in the loop, uh, in the decision-making loop can slow down, well, it does slow down the process, um, the decision-making process, and it also allows for judgment and consideration that machines may not be able to carry out. Importantly, humans can pick up on de-escalatory signs um, in, in ways that machines cannot. Maybe machines will be able to in the future, but as of right now, um, humans are much better um, at spotting these signals. And then of course, machines themselves are not immune to technological failure, and they're also not immune to um, hostile takeover. Now, the potential military utility of these new technologies and the role that these new, technology, new technologies, especially hypersonic technologies, um, have in modernization programs um, is, is contributing to, to kind of new arms races. So as, as many of you probably know, the US, China, and Russia um, are all in the process of developing their own hypersonic weapons programs. They're all at various different stages, but they're all developing these programs in some capacity. And so this increased reliance on hypersonic technology in the modernization of nuclear arsenals is arguably making these countries more reliant on, on nuclear weapons as a deterrent, not less. And so this is it's complicating disarmament efforts in, in important ways. Um, Michal, if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Now, it's worth reiterating here that the promises and perils of these new technologies, again, don't come from the intrinsic properties of the technologies themselves, which is a very interesting discussion in its own right, but um, it comes rather from, from the way that these technologies are applied. So a couple of minutes ago, I talked about how the inclusion of artificial intelligence in decision making can have destabilizing effects. But on the flip side, the use of artificial intelligence in, in decision making can also have um, some benefits. In particular, if artificial intelligence is used as kind of a quote unquote smart advisor to a human decision maker, the the machine can provide more accurate information in less time to the human decision maker, which can actually lessen the risk of miscalculation. So again, it's about how these technologies are applied. Um, and a lot of these technologies, and Michal will go into more detail later on in the presentation, um, can also create opportunities, um, especially when we're talking about nuclear safeguards and, and verification regimes. In large part, these technologies can, can help increase transparency and strengthen confidence building um, among states. Michal, if you could go to the next slide, please. So because the impact of uh, studying the impact of, of these technologies on nuclear disarmament is, is necessarily hard to observe, um, we wanted to understand how experts and um, practitioners view this issue. How do they frame these discussions? Are emerging technologies and nuclear weapons um, discussed together separately? So we used two main methods to collect our data. We um, 
we created and fielded an expert survey to a sample of 427 experts from, from around the world. And the largest group um, of the experts self-identified as nuclear weapons experts. And then in order to complement the expert survey, we um, interviewed around 14 policy elites and using semi-structured interviews, we, we wanted to understand how, how they themselves um, viewed, viewed this issue. And so now I'm gonna pass it over to Michal, who's gonna go into more detail about the results of the, of the research. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline, very much. Um, so we, we did this survey on this um, rather large sample of experts to, and we asked them a few um, relatively simple questions. And um, I'm going to go and through, through the answers that they gave us. But um, very often it's said that um, academic research is not a mystery novel. So let me give you a taste of the, of the main findings that we, uh, we, we found in our research. Our, one of the, our uh, leading findings is that experts are generally very uh, unanimous in seeing emerging technologies as relatively destabilizing. Um, when we asked experts on their views on the effect of the three major technologies that we asked in the survey, um, the cyber technologies, artificial intelligence, and the hypersonic gliding vehicles, um, overwhelming majorities of experts in all three cases fall that these technologies are destabilizing. In case of hypersonic glide vehicles, it's 85%. In case of cyber, it's 84%. And in the case of artificial intelligence, it's 72% of experts. So really large majorities of people um, and of experts, people who sort of earn their living by studying these things and working on these things um, are very concerned about these technologies. Um, however, these experts also think that um, emerging technologies are very unlikely to carry out strategic tasks. And we are going to come back to that in a little while, but um, experts basically um, have a view that nuclear weapons are, um, uh, are hard to replace when it comes to carrying out um, really hardcore strategic tasks of security. Um, thirdly, experts say that there is an opportunity in a way how emerging technologies could contribute um, towards nuclear disarmament. And that is particularly through verification. And again, I'm going to come back to that in a little while. Um, our own conclusion from talking, uh, from analyzing these surveys and from talking to um, the policy elites that we talked to is that um, if we are going to think about emerging technologies within the framework of nuclear security, we need to bring in some new fresh thinking and um, step beyond what we have been doing um, up until today. So let me continue with um, the uh, first, um, one of the first um, slides with the results. We asked the experts whether they, how do, how would they affect um, or um, assess the effect of these technologies on inadvertent escalation. And we focused on inadvertent escalation because most of these scholars who write about these technologies point out to the risks of inadvertent escalation as one of the major, uh, major uh, risk factors when it comes to emerging technologies. Um, and we were quite surprised to see that most of the experts think that these technologies increase uh, the risks of inadvertent escalation. About 80% of experts are very concerned about this um, in case of artificial intelligence. So they are very concerned about the fact that um, these technologies might actually lead to conflict, even though in our um, elite interviews, the elites have been quite skeptical about how far the states are going to be willing to implement um, artificial intelligence in uh, nuclear decision making. Um, one of our elites said that, um, the respondents said that uh, they didn't expect that in their lifetime, um, any, for example, nuclear use is going to be pre-delegated to a machine rather than to a human. Um, but um, experts are, this is really at the forefront of experts' minds. Um, it's a very similar case in case of hypersonic um, glide vehicles. And you can also think about why that might be the case um, because these vehicles are um, very, of course they are very fast, but they are also, um, they have properties that make them uh, quite um, useful for um, escalatory steps. Um, 
We also asked, um, as I mentioned, the second thing that we asked about experts is whether these technologies might be able to carry strategic tasks. And that was, um, and we were basically curious whether they think that any of the, whether any of these technologies can in the long run um, create um, an alternative to the use of nuclear weapons. And if they can create the use of, uh, towards the use of nuclear weapons, we can then think more um, easily about um, um, some sort of substitution um, between these technologies and nuclear weapons. Um, in case of cyber technology, about more than half of our experts thought that um, cyber is unlikely to carry the strategic tasks. And in the elite interviews, this has actually uh, been confirmed. Um, our, um, our respondents have been quite clear that they don't see uh, and their institution where institutions within which they work usually don't see um, uh, cyber warfare as a strategic weapon. They don't see this as a something um, that can um, guarantee certain strategic outcomes. And very often um, experts mention that um, cyber is not suited for this purpose because it's a, it's a rather complex, um, they, they, they often see it as a very complex technology and they often see it as a, something that is extremely unpredictable. And for that reason, sort of, um, it's hard to see what kind of effect could a cyber weapon really deliver if, um, unless it's being used. And once it's being used, it cannot be reused again because you know, the, the holes will get patched up and so on and so forth. Um, we were quite surprised that every now and then we heard uh, references to the sheer destructiveness of nuclear weapons, which is assured and certain um, as being the reason that differentiates um, nuclear weapons from any other technology um, that, we, that we discussed. Um, however, not everything is lost. Um, our interviewee stated that there is um, quite a bit of potential for emerging technologies to contribute to nuclear disarmament um, through, um, uh, through verification. Um, the former, um, um, there, there are also other scholars who have talked about this. Um, for example, Laura Rockwood, who used to be at the Vienna Center, uh, wrote a paper in 2018 when she discussed about how distributed ledger technologies, uh, which the HIP participants in this call uh, may know from Bitcoin, can um, be used or structured in such a way that um, they can be uh, used for accounting of nuclear materials, for example. And this can be useful um, in later stage, for example, for uh, verification of nuclear disarmament. Um, many of our um, elite respondents whom we interviewed uh, mentioned advances in image recognition software um, that uses artificial intelligence that can open up space for more actors to be used in nuclear disarmament verification. And they um, um, and our respondents often mention that these technologies together with remote sensing could make uh, nuclear verification measures more robust. Um, they, the, the bottom line is that the use of these technologies can um, in a way contribute towards confidence building and building of greater trust and cooperation uh, between states uh, when, once they decide to move towards nuclear disarmament. Um, now, speaking of the nuclear disarmament, we um, asked uh, experts about their views about when the nuclear disarmament is going to happen. And we asked them um, a few questions, but the ones that we want to share with you today is question um, uh, that we asked uh, in which we asked the experts uh, whether they think that it is likely that nuclear disarmament is going to happen when technologies will um, allow for verification of disarmament. As you, and as you can see, um, only 30% of our respondents disagreed and vast majority of respondents agreed that basically the verification is really the problem. And so the, uh, nuclear, uh, the emerging technologies can really contribute towards nuclear disarmament through helping with the verification of nuclear disarmament. At the same time, um, about half, um, our experts were split about half half when it comes to whether they think that nuclear emerging technologies can ever replace um, or supplant nuclear weapons. Um, about half of our experts thought that this is, uh, they disagreed with this statement and um, slightly less than half um, um, agreed. And so you can see that there is a, quite a bit of hesitation um, among the experts about the way how they think that nuclear um, the emerging technologies um, can be used to supplant nuclear weapons. And they also 
um, somehow are still, um, they still um, see that nuclear uh, weapons have a uh, very important, are a very important symbol and, and, it's a, um, and, and convey certain international status. Um, in, in shortly, um, um, we became um, interested in the link between emerging technologies and deterrence. And we have also, um, in addition to the survey and, and the interviews that we organized, uh, we also spoke to a number of defense experts. And the, um, one of the things that we often um, heard from the experts is that if you think about deterrence by denial, so in other words, denying the adversary to do certain step, then we can think about emerging technologies and conventional technology and advanced conventional technologies as having a certain potential for the future. However, if you think about deterrence by punishment, in other words, um, inflicting mass um, suffering on the adversary, um, their nuclear weapons are going to be probably unique for uh, foreseeable future uh, because of their um, sheer destructiveness um, that makes them extremely, that makes the nuclear risk extremely salient and extremely high, but they also are seen as somehow uh, as something valuable in the eyes of um, certain military experts. Now we want to wrap this, our present, initial presentation up by talking about um, our fourth point, which we mentioned, which is that if we are going to think about um, emerging technologies within um, this, the framework of um, nuclear arms control, as has been suggested, um, then we need to think about it in a different way. Um, there have been a number of reports recently um, that have suggested that uh, the discussions about uh, emerging technologies should be brought to the framework of um, nuclear arms control. There has been, for example, a recent report put forward by the King's College London where this was suggested, but there have been also side events at the MPT uh, PrepComs uh, last year where this issue has been raised. And um, when, when we think about this very often, and when we think to, when we talk to many experts and, and policy elites who work on issues of nuclear arms control, um, they have been very skeptical about the, any, any sort of arms control measures because they very often came, came it, their, their skepticism came down to the view that um, you can't really count um, cyber weapons and you can't really use the um, old fashioned ways of um, doing arms control as has been done in the nuclear sphere, um, basically ever since the Cold War. And that is really true um, because you can't really um, use these old fashioned ways. And so, um, but this doesn't mean that, for example, there is no way to, for example, to conduct arms control in a cyberspace. There has been um, a set of uh, multi-stakeholder discussions um, that have been taking place and um, even though there is no formal way of conducting arms control in the cyber space as we know it from the nuclear area, um, that doesn't mean that her, there has never been a discussion about um, limiting um, the damage that comes from the use of these um, cyber weapons. Um, and there are um, uh, confidence building measures um, and other means that have been used by states there. And so if we are going to, um, to, to have this discussion about emerging technologies within the uh, nuclear sphere, as has been suggested by numerous experts, we have to shift our thinking away from um, controlling capabilities to controlling behavior. And that might require quite a bit of mental and cultural shift among the experts. Um, but if we want to successfully bring in these discussions and really tackle the problems that emerging technologies pose for nuclear arms control, then we need to make this mental shift. Um, Elena, thank you very much for, uh, for our, and everyone else, thank you very much for your attention. And I'm, we are now happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Michal and Madeline. Uh, I think it's uh, very interesting and the results are uh, to a certain degree, I would say expected. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, you know, it's good to see uh, even the uh, exact figures where the uh, experts and practitioners are placing some of these risks or how they view these new technologies. We already have a number of questions uh, put into the chat. I will um, 
to screen and select them, uh, but I would also encourage others to, again, those who joined us late to um, use Q&A uh, function for your questions. It is for those who are, uh, look, uh, who are viewing us through Zoom. For those who are uh, watching it on YouTube, please send your questions to events at vcdmp.org. Uh, Michal, may I ask you to uh, stop sharing your slides? Yes. Sorry, yes, of course. That would be easier than uh, to um, conduct the rest of the uh, session with the Q&As. Uh, several questions that, um, uh, you know, first of all, there are some congratulatory notes, very interesting, but um, this is more of a comment than a question. The question that I would actually like to hear, and uh, uh, it is George, unfortunately, I don't see the last name, who also is interested in learning what are the backgrounds, uh, the field of study of the experts that you interviewers, uh, where they come from, law, political scientists, diplomats, um, international relations, or they're more technical experts. So that, that, that's the question that I would really like for you to tackle as well. Um, so let me, let me start by this and then I might pass the floor to Madeline because she has been playing with this data. Um, plurality of our experts come from Europe. So about, about 30% come from Europe and the rest come from North America, from Asia and from Africa. I think we have experts from every single continent. Um, most of our experts are um, in the policy field. So they are either um, think tankers or they are either presently um, diplomats or they have been reti uh, retired diplomats. Um, Madeline can tell you a little more about how we, how we um, put together the sampling frame, but uh, we basically um, try to, to get as broad um, sam um, um, sample as possible. And given that they have this very broad um, uh, work background, they also have very different educational background. There are some of them who are um, political, well, who have background in political science or in, in law, but there is also quite a few of them who have, for example, a background in physics and currently work in different think tanks. And Madeline can tell you a little more about how we basically put together the list of experts. Sure. So, um, yeah, as Michal said, um, the, the experts come from a diverse set of backgrounds. Um, you know, we had, we had some people who focus more on cyber, some who, who focus um, mainly on nuclear weapons, um, you know, others who, who focus on international relations more broadly. But the way that we kind of put the list together was we looked at um, people who have been, uh, who have been published um, on, on this topic and also um, those who are who participate or work for various institutions that are active in the in the N NPT review conferences and 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 prep committees. Um, so we really wanted to to you know reach out to people who uh, who really focus on 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 this for a living. Um, but we yeah we were also very keen on getting. You know, cyber is is a growing field, um, so we were also very keen on on getting those experts um, and their opinions as well. Thank you so much, uh, both of you. Um, I'll ask you a few more questions um, sure. that came in. Um, one is from Diana. Um, I, mean, I don't know the last name. Doesn't show. Um, one of the questions that she's interested in, I will actually be interested to hear as well. Um, it looks like much of the study on this issue focuses on the uh, assumption that we're speaking about the use of these technologies by state actors. Um, have you specifically looked into or um, uh, was it part of the, your uh, survey to look at um, the difference when it comes to the non-state actors using these technologies and the impact, how much that was part of your research? 
Um, it's a fabulous question. Thank you very much for, for asking that question. Um, in fact, some of the um, theoretical literature that we studied um, at the beginning of our research um, talks, especially when it comes to cyber technology, because I can't really imagine a non-state actor building a hypersonic missile, but uh, of course in the, in the field of cyber, it's more easier to imagine. And some of the scholars actually do talk about issues related to attribution and uh, related to um, how, how are you going to make sure to, that, um, that you are basically targeting the actors who, um, who have been behind um, any sort of uh, cyber attack. Um, we actually asked this question to the policy elites that we interviewed. And um, we have been quite surprised and that might be something that is um, one of the um, less expected outcomes of this project. Um, the policy elites have been less concerned about this issue. They, um, most of the experts that we interviewed, especially those who work, um, who earn their living by working on cyber, have been telling us that the issues related to attribution are getting better and better. And so it becomes much easier to actually find out who has been behind different, um, different types of activities. And numerous experts um, have basically raised an issue that um, the capability of state and non-state actors um, actually vastly differs. And um, this comes back again to the point that very often you hear people talking about cyber as a relatively low cost, um, 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 uh, relatively low cost solution. Um, but um, our experts um, actually said, if you are actually going to do like um, a really high end cyber warfare, those, um, that is beyond the, the means of um, even the poorer countries. That actually requires quite a bit of investment. Um, and, and so um, they actually were less concerned about this distinction between the state and the non-state actors. When it comes to the strategic use of cyber or sort of um, like really um, um, other, other uses than, for example, um, um, cyber attacks against banks with a goal to steal currency, for example. Thank you so much. Um, there are a number of questions that are actually um, triggered by the um, comments you made about the responsible behavior rather than the tra traditional arms control. Yeah. Um, mode uh, for some of these technologies, particularly I understand cyber, maybe the use of their artificial intelligence. So uh, the, the questions are first, well, um, one is promoting that behavior is one thing, but actually how it could be translated into some objective terms, what kind of agreements. And in uh, aligned with that, uh, that question was from Pamela uh, Moraga. And um, I think there is another person who is also interested in uh, hearing more about the regulation of the cyberspace, uh, Arthur DuForest. Um, and uh, he actually mentions a couple of tools, including the Talent Manual and EU Cyber Diplomacy Toolbox. Um, uh, the, the question, can regulators and politicians tackle these issues proactively and preemptively rather than constantly adapting to the consequences of the emerging tax attack? This is kind of a tack on question to that. Uh, so about the uh, behavior and various attempts in this uh, area and also regarding the um, being more proactive rather than reactive. Um, Madeline, do you want to pick up the question about the behavior and then I'll talk about the proactive versus reactive? Sure. Um, so that's an excellent question. Um, my answer is probably, <laughs> it's not going to please many of you, <laughs> but I think, I think, um, you know, in terms of, in terms of the norms, uh, in cyberspace, there's still, there's still an issue in terms of coming to a to an agreement about the set of norms and the set of appropriate behavior in cyberspace. Um, you know, a set of norms, the way that China views the norms and the way that the US views the norms um, are, are very different. And so coming to it to an agreement that that would then kind of govern 
the way that these cyber capabilities are used is going to be very difficult. Um, but you know, the, the OSCE, some of the policy elites whom we spoke to um, mentioned, several of them mentioned the OSCE um, confidence building um, measures that try to establish um, appropriate parameters for, for cyber activity. And I think, I think building on that and trying to scale that up um, is probably the way to go. Now that's much, much easier said than done. Um, but, but I think, I think that's probably the most, the most realistic way of, of trying to, to govern cyber activity. Um, let me tackle the question about the proactive versus reactive way. Um, I think this is one of the things that, um, the experts and diplomats who, um, argue for including these issues in the, uh, in, the, in the nuclear arms control discussions try to do. They try to be a little more proactive um, as these um, technologies are slowly becoming more and more ubiquitous in, the nuclear, um, in nuclear security. And um, the, um, there is quite a bit of, um, there is quite a bit of, um, I, um, I don't want to say excitement, but there is quite a, quite a few ideas that are floating around about how this should be done, for example, within the MPT review process. Um, and um, very often, if these are being presented, you hear the pushback saying, oh, but you can't really, uh, you can't verify the way how we used to do this. And um, we don't take view on whether this should be done in a reactive or proactive way, but we think, um, I think in, in a, as a, as a, if you, if you want to regulate these things and if you want to be proactive about it, the only thing we say is you have to shift the way um, the, the thinking is being done on these issues. Um, and if you are going to, um, um, to think about, um, for example, regulating certain cyber behaviors um, in, um, um, in the MP, uh, or talking about certain cyber behaviors in, in the nuclear arms control settings, um, which is completely um, acceptable, then there is a way to do this. You know, um, you have to do this in a way that is different than you would talk about, for example, counting nuclear warheads. And the second thing that I think is important is that there is quite a bit of discussion about um, risk reduction in nuclear arms control. And one of the things that um, we find very useful is that if you want to sort of start talking about uh, emerging technologies in nuclear arms control, um, bringing it in in the in the discussions about risk reduction might actually be one of the more um, I don't want to say easier, but it might be one of the uh, more convenient ways to do this, precisely because these discussions are sort of done in a in among the among the countries that do have nuclear weapons and that they. Uh, somehow try to understand each other. And so if you bring emerging technologies there, it might actually, well, of course it might make discussions a little more complex, but this might be actually the, the most um, easy, the easiest way to actually bring in these discussions um, uh, to the table. Thank you, thank you both. Uh, I think there are a couple of um, maybe uh, follow on questions to what you've just uh, mentioned. One is uh, uh, from Maria Brandsteller from um, OSCE. Um, as you suggest that uh, we should be targeting the behavior rather than uh, quantities uh, counting for some of these technologies. Does it mean that we're moving away from legally binding um, agreements to, towards politically binding agreements in the future? It's a little bit of a different uh, question on it. And the other one is related to um, uh, what you just mentioned that the nuclear, those who possess nuclear weapons need to have these discussions among themselves first and, and yeah. foremost. Um, uh, Thomas Schmidt is asking uh, there, uh, that there seems to be a general consensus that strategic stability is in acute danger under the conditions of emerging technologies. That's his words. Uh, how can this insight now be translated into uh, strategy formation and political action? How can the US, USA and Russia first and foremost 
uh, find and build new strategic relationships adapted to these new strategic conditions. So here we go. Back to you. Perfect. Um, so, um, Madeline, do you want to tackle again the first question or? Um, OK, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I can tackle Maria's question. Um, so I think, again, this is an excellent question, and it's something that, that a lot of policymakers are, are wrestling with at the moment. Um, I think that when it comes to enabling dual use technologies like artificial intelligence and cyber, um, I think a mix actually of regulations and soft law um, could, be, could be pretty effective. Um, again, much easier said than done, but but you know the the combination of regulations and soft law is kind of a mix, right? Of legally binding measures, but also um, political binding measures. Of course, with soft law, the the issue is that there has to be political will behind it, and there also has to be a commitment to comply. Um, and you know, in the absence of of enforcement mechanisms, this can be very difficult to uh, to enforce. But but I do. I don't, I don't see it so much as moving completely away from legally binding um, regulations or agreements, but I do think that, that having a healthy mix of, of soft law and, and regulations um, would, would be beneficial. Thank you, Madeline. Um, Michal? Um, thank you very much. So this is actually a fabulous question about the, the strategic relations. And I want to ta start tackling it from a little broader um, discussion because um, um, the sort of um, discussing about strategic stability and any discussion about, um, about strategic stability, if it's going to take a, among, if it's going to take place between the US and Russia or whether it's going to take among the P5, um, um, there uh, sort of needs to um, start or needs to discuss also things about um, the conditions under which states can imagine using their, um, their nuclear weapons. And once you start having the discussion, it's actually not that difficult to start talking about um, different aspects that um, emerging technologies can bring about. So for example, um, uh, what, uh, whether um, cyber attacks and what kind of cyber attacks might uh, might uh, be um, uh, might be the ones that might trigger, for example, certain discussions, or um, there might be more um, transparency among the P5 members in terms of um, how much they see the role of these technologies. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that all the discussions should be now about emerging tech, but I think once um, the P5 are ready to have these discussions um, to sort of improve the stabi uh, st uh, strategic stability among them. Um, it's um, it actually imp imp implementing these questions related to the use of um, emerging technologies and how important the emerging technologies are in the national security strategies of these countries is actually right, um, easier, um, easier than it might be at the first sight. Thank you, Michal. Thank you, Madeline. Um, there are uh, some additional questions that I would like to have you answer. But before that, I think very important question from our one of our YouTube uh, viewers is uh, when uh, this study is going to be published and where they can read more about your work. Um, this is a fantastic question. Um, we are um, um, one of the, we are presenting here the study that is in a way it's complete, but we also want to um, hear what um, experts such as the audience at the Vienna Center has to add. And so we plan in the near future to implement the feedback from this um, session and then publish uh, the information on the website um, of the project um, and of the Erasmus University. Um, when, once the paper is out, uh, we'll make sure that it's also going to be distributed by the social media, including of the Vienna Center, since we presented the research here. And so we, we, we expect that the result is going to be out, um, well, very soon. We'll make sure when we publish the report about today's webinars. Yes. To add the link to your study once it's done, when it's published. Um, that would be very nice. Um, I have a couple of kind of smallish follow-up questions. I don't see 
uh, additional ones popping up, but um, one of the question um, is uh, related to uh, probably less to the strategic uh, issues, but more about the security of nuclear materials and facilities. And, yes. uh, one of Diana uh, is asking, um, she's looking at the um, design basis threat analysis and risk assessment. So um, how could these technologies could be used, uh, particularly say artificial intelligence, machine learning to um, actually help with uh, the assessment of threats, but also whether they could be misused in uh, kind of finding vulnerabilities, um, identifying them. Uh, there is a related question to that is, for example, if non-state actors and hackers use cyber or artificial intelligence uh, for, for example, surveillance of the nuclear facilities and uh, nuclear sites, or they can hack the communication. So it's more about the uh, physical security of the nuclear infrastructure rather than uh, about the use of nuclear weapons. Um, thank you very much. This is actually something that uh, we have been um, thinking about in, um, quite a bit. And um, we, um, uh, we thought about this, the way how these technologies can be, can be used. Um, we, um, it's, when it comes to the, the potential is one of, the potential is very easy to um, uh, be demonstrated with the use uh, with, when it comes to artificial intelligence. If you, for example, the traditional way how non-proliferation analysts have been analyzing um, the progress of, in, in, of nuclear programs in different countries is um, you look at the pictures of the installations and you look at them over a longer period of time and try to see whether there are changes that are taking place. And these technologies, um, there has been some advan uh, advance in um, using artificial intelligence to automate some of those steps um, when it comes to early warning systems. And um, that also, of course, creates also opportunities to, be, to use that in um, um, non-proliferation um, scenarios when you can automate some of these activities and um, uh, use the freed up skills of analysts to focus on other areas. And so you can, you can automate some of those um, uh, detection, uh, detection um, or in theory, this could be um, somehow automated. Um, of course, there are risks like with everything in, in the field of um, emerging technologies, uh, these technologies do pose risks and they do pose um, these um, um, potential for misuse. Um, and this comes back to the resilience of systems and how, how well they are protected and how well they are resilient um, against, um, against internal, um, external um, intervention. Um, the, uh, the risks that are related to the, uh, to the um, external, um, external intervention in these systems um, is something that is at the very forefront of the experts and, and, and the policy elites. And this is really, if you, for example, talk to them about um, the cyber threats, this is really like number one thing that they think about, the, uh, the um, and, um, entry of, of malicious actors. Um, however, it also seems that as they are sort of thinking about um, securing that, then over time, this is going to become less of a problem uh, and other problems are going to become uh, more and more um, salient in, in this respect. Um, Madeline, do you want to add anything here? Or did I miss something? No, you did not. <laughs> okay. Okay, it seems like you have tackled all the questions, which is great. Uh, I don't see any uh, additional one uh, popping up. Um, I'm sure that many of the, those who tuned in today uh, learned quite a bit uh, from both uh, the, your overview of the issues and uh, from the results of the studies that you conducted. Um, and many are interested in seeing the, the publication in the end. Yeah. Um, so we would 
um, all be looking towards to that. And uh, hopefully you will continue to conduct uh, the survey of the experts and their views. And if there are any uh, publications that you would like also to for us to uh, point to, I know that um, in our uh, chat, uh, our VCDNP uh, support staff just put a link to one of your publications. Um, available at the European Leadership Network uh, focusing on this issue. Um, so there are many of the publications that are coming out on this topic and it's very interesting to see maybe over time how the views are changing. Um, and uh, I hope you will continue doing your work. But in the meantime, I really appreciate you taking time uh, to uh, first you know, update the audience about the, the work in this field, um, these important issues. And thank you also for being so efficient with the question and answers uh, part. Um, on behalf of the VCDNP and all our staff and hopefully all the participants who are join, joined us on Zoom and uh, on YouTube, uh, we greatly appreciate your, um, uh, your enlightening us today and uh, wishing you all the best. And uh, thank you everyone. Uh, this will, will conclude our webinar today. Thank you. thank you. We thank you also for fa fabulous questions and for the opportunity to present our work. Thank you thank so you much. All. Thank, thank you. you, it was great to have you. Bye. Thank you, bye. Bye bye.